Oops, I thought I saw Tina. Ah, oh, there she comes. Tina, how are you? It's a technical, but I got through. No worries. Oh, no worries. All right. So I am Karen Pearson. I am so pleased to welcome you to our closing um, panel discussion for the 16th annual Sustainable Business and Design Conference here at FIT. We've been exploring pathways to impact. We have been looking at cross-sectional points across sustainability that really get at the four key pillars of sustainability and all of those intersection, intersectional points. So over the course of this conference, we have looked at social and corporate responsibility, consumption and waste, environment and materials, and design and business. And to that front, at this final session, I am joined here by a really exciting group. And again, we have brought back one of our amazing alumni, Jennifer Grove, to talk about her story and her journey from FIT and beyond and how sustainability has kind of really, in the end, shaped what she has done with her FIT education and also how she's grown that FIT education into all of her future work. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Jennifer to you. Um, Jennifer's gonna give us a little bit of background about her story and then we're gonna start off our conversation today here really focused on this idea of communication in sustainability and how we're talking about it across all the pillars, across multiple disciplines. We're joined by Chris and Tina, and they're gonna share their experiences and also some of their other work here with us and with Jennifer. So Jennifer, first, let me start with you. And first of all, welcome. Thank you so much for being part of our FIT community and being so willing to share and collaborate with us in this space. Um, you and I've talked about sustainability many, many times at this point um, in a number of different formats, but I always like to start and have you tell just a little bit about your story and your background and then leave that into what you're working on now. Sure. And I think the easiest way to start, uh, well, first of all, thank you, Karen, for having me, but I think we just saw John Mangarelli pop into our chat and um, I'm so thrilled and honored that he is joining us on this panel today. He's the first person I met at FIT when I walked in the door. He was um, assigned to me as my advisor. So we're talking decades ago. <laughs> so the fact that uh, I think that speaks volumes about the FIT community that you can meet people who will mentor you throughout your um, course selection and then your career into industry. This is a person who shepherded me throughout my early fashion industry days uh, when I was working in different companies and then a support system um, with my first startup business. And I, I've been a serial entrepreneur for the past two decades and just someone who has been a great mentor and friend over the years. So I, I think that just um, should say something to FIT students that your, your teachers, your classmates are there with you for life. As an FIT faculty member, I think <laughs> that speaks volumes to what I think myself and my colleagues and the entire FIT community does wish to convey, which is our undying support. And I think also in the FIT community, we're so special in the sense that we have such partnerships with industry and many of these industry leaders also come back and really are very giving to mentor our students and our faculty as well. Um, do you want to share a little bit more about what you studied at FIT and then how that has led you to maybe some of your more recent work in sustainability in particular? Sure. The, it's a great segue. I, I started off uh, with a fashion buying and merchandising degree, and then I went on and got my bachelor's in uh, marketing and merchandise management. Uh, my first business was a bricks and mortar retail store. <laughs> And from there, after I sold that business, I launched my first e-commerce marketplace. And uh, uh, John was actually helpful uh, in allowing me to, uh, he created a, a pathway, if you will, uh, for me to come back to FIT. I was the youngest uh, adjunct professor um, at the time. Um, I wrote and taught the first merchandising for e-commerce course at FIT. 
So that was a long time ago. And here I am full circle. I'm now launching um, another e-commerce marketplace all these years later, but it, it ties my entire career together. Um, CSR, ESG, it's all about sustainability. So um, it's a startup. So while we're diligently building the tech for this marketplace, um, I have decided to start talking, having conversations and building community, um, which is why we have these two amazing panelists here today, because they are part of the Rejoice community and we're using podcasting as a tool to talk about sustainability. I think that's really kind of a beautiful story and a really a great segue, which is we have spent a lot of time over the last two days talking about the need for communication and how we're communicating about sustainability and how we're getting buy in at all levels for the stories and the importance of change and stewardship in that space. So it would be really excellent if you could talk a little bit about how and why you feel communication and sustainability is so important and how you're transitioning that into platforms and ways where you feel we're really getting at all levels of the audience that's starting to make change or demanding change in how we're producing, how we're consuming, and all of these different facets that relate to kind of our commercial markets, if you will say. Yeah, absolutely. I actually, I wanted to share some, some facts with everybody because I think um, some of us have become numb when we think about climate change and sustainability. And when you, when you think about feelings and facts about climate change, we have to remember that we have to learn how to separate facts from feelings. And it's so important. It's, it's critical when we're, we're talking about uh, communication and, and spreading this message of of change. And so um, I wanted to share a couple of, of facts from a climate change survey of 10,000 young people um, ages 16 to 25 uh, that was taken uh, in December of 2021 from Lancet. Um, they collected data on feelings about climate change, climate anxiety, climate related distress and government responses to climate change. And so it's really worth noting the facts behind this very basic headline that reads, respondents are very worried about climate change. So 59% were very or extremely worried, 84% were at least moderately worried, more than 50% reported each of the following emotions, sad, anxious, angry, powerless, helpless, and guilty. And more than 45% of respondents said that their feelings about climate change negatively affected their daily life and functioning. 75% said that they think the future is frightening, and 83% said that they think people have failed to take care of the planet. So I thought, Karen, you're probably very excited that I'm closing out the conference on them. <laughs> Some very upbeat statistics. But <laughs> okay, I was actually just sitting here thinking that what I was thrilled about is, as a scientist and as a teacher, that you were actually talking about the importance of supporting your statements with actual research and data. Yeah. Uh, and the importance of understanding that, yes, there are scientific facts and data we can associate directly with climate change related to ocean temperature, um, actual average air temperature, or other natural events. But these other components in the research space that are maybe considered to be, lack, for lack of a better word, a little bit softer, have a really direct impact on how we are creating policy, how we are talking about it and communicating about sustainability. So I think the need for literacy and hopefully making, you know, one of the things I strive for in the science or the classroom is scientific literacy. So I think what you're really speaking to is the need for creating literacy as it relates to sustainability, which turns out to be a multidisciplinary effort. Yeah. Well, and, and these, this is the data that supports the fact that we now have a category that warrants um, our own therapy behind eco anxiety. We are at a point now where young kids don't even want to have kids because it's too depressing of a thought to bring children onto this planet. And that's, that doomer feeling is just, it, it's due to communication. So, you know, if you think about how we got to this point, we can turn that around and communication is the way to do that. It's, there's a 
a tool we have to change that messaging and spread positive change. So we've got all of, and this whole conference has been about how do we create um, a path to impact, whether it's inclusive dialogue or education, empowerment, engagement, um, all of these ecosystems that we're building, it's, it's all based on communication if we are going to create actual impact and change. We've spent the past two days talking about it in every single one of these sessions. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I think every single one of these sessions in different ways has brought that exact point, which is our need to talk about it, communicate, but also have it be successful, um, accessible, sorry, not successful. We do want it to be successful, but to be accessible and in that also to make sure that we celebrate that small changes made by a lot of people have really big impact. And yes. that anytime we make a positive change, we are slightly tipping the needle in the correct direction, and that should be celebrated. That yes. doesn't mean we can't do more, but those small changes really matter. And I think that's been something that everybody has also spoken to. Yes, now I, I saw that common thread throughout every session that I saw that I sat in, and I was like, oh, but you have to come to our, our panel because that's exactly what we're talking about. And that's why I was really excited to get the um, podcast. Our, so our, our podcast is called Let's Rejoice Together. And it, it's all about building this collective community where we can talk about um, the small changes that you make collectively. They do actually add up. And um, Chris and Tina, when, when we start getting into the questions, um, you'll see how they have done that on their own and how they're able to communicate that. It's really, it's been so exciting um, talking about it because it they create these uh, relatable examples to start spreading these messages for change. So, well, I think that's a great segue also to kind of give you the floor and kind of show where the magic can be in utilization of these tools. Okay, well, I I love that and I appreciate that and I'm I'm so glad we're we're here to talk about it today. So um, with that, um, if everybody is ready for some questions, Tina and Chris, I know we've, <laughs> we've spoken about this a lot, but I'm really excited for you to kind of introduce these concepts to the FIT community. Um, Chris, why don't we start with you? Um, so if everyone could kind of think about the dry cleaning community, everything you feel and think you know about the dry cleaning community. <laughs> Um, this is Chris White from America's Best Cleaners. Chris, if you want to introduce yourself and reframe that perspective for everybody and, and tell us about America's Best Cleaners mission. Sure. I appreciate you guys. Thanks for having me here. And I, too, am part of the FIT community. Um, a good friend of mine, uh, Sal Jardina, teaches fibers and fabrics, and I've been invited many times to talk about care, care labeling rules and, and um, eco um of uh, fibers and fabrics and how they react. And I'm doing studies with some custom clothers and fabric houses now just on that matter. But um, to answer your question, America's Best Cleaners, uh, first and foremost, is a certification agency that goes out and seeks the finest dry cleaners in the United States, Canada, and people around the world. Um, our first mission is to service the fashion elite, the fashion houses, and the fashion manufacturers so that they can feel confident that their creations uh, with whatever textile or other fiber they choose to use um, or create creative process um, can be maintained. And that stems from designer jeans to Cirque du Soleil costumes to um, fashions that are on the runway show or a recent fashion week um, wrapping up in, in all the major markets. Uh, we see a lot of those collections coming in to be preserved for historical um, preservation. So um, that's our first and foremost. The second thing behind that is that we've always in our 20 now 21 years existence been um, on the forefront of developing, implementing the latest eco friendly or environmentally friendly principles and practices, both in the cleaning, the operations and the practice of packaging or developing the facilities in which we do this work. And so we are take pride in the fact that we take a leadership role in not just the quality of what we do, but also how we go about doing it. Amazing. And just uh, to put things into context, how many uh, businesses are within the association right now? Currently right now, um, coming out of COVID here, we currently only have 28 that are certified in the United States. So it is an elite group. Uh, we have seven um, international affiliates, um, most in Europe and one in uh, Auckland, New Zealand. 
that participate in our events also. So there is a global communication that takes place and um, we do like to go over and visit our friends in Europe whenever we can to learn from them. So that always adds another element of fun to our group. Amazing. And this is Tina Hedges from Lolly. Tina, if you want to give an introduction and tell us all about Lolly. Sure, thanks. And it's such an honor to be here. So thank you so much, Jennifer. And um, I really appreciate it. And to FIT, um, I have always admired this, um, you know, uh, time that you take to really promote uh, sustainability. So thank you. Um, Lolly, I'm the founder of Lolly. And Lolly is the world's first zero waste organic skincare brand. And for us, um, we launched in 2018. Um, we were really like a year and a half early. No one cared about zero waste beauty, believe it or not. And we'll get into that in the panel, why that matters. Um, but uh, the way we're zero waste is we upcycle from organic food supply. So we take um, ingredients that are being wasted in the food supply chain and repurpose them for powerful skincare ingredients. We formulate without water. Um, again, I'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later, but um, you know, you're mostly buying water when you're buying your skin, hair, and body products, and even makeup. Um, and then um, we also uh, package in a fully sustainable way. So we use refillable, recyclable, um, recycled, and even garden compostable materials. We even grow mushrooms for our outer packaging. So um, we really are walking the walk. And, um, and it's, I'm very proud to say that Lolly changed the entire beauty industry. Um, so, um, the impact has been enormous. And I think it's, it's important for, um, to put this all in context, because both Tina and Chris, uh, coming from beauty and fashion, garment care, textiles, no matter what industry you're in, I hope there are some takeaways for everybody, uh, no matter what industry you're in, to, to learn uh, from the communication um, that they're going to share today. So let's get started. Um, Chris, I'm going to actually begin with a quote from our recent uh, Rejoice podcast interview. You, you encapsulated something so beautifully. Um, you expressed how we're all capable of making micro decisions every day that can make a macro change. And I, I think I was just, I was so excited because I was like, yes, that is my exact point. <laughs> so I've got a, a multi-part question for you. Sure. Uh, you're leading an entire association of the most talented and as you said, elite garment care businesses and dry cleaning experts in our nation that are really committed to embracing the most sustainable business practices in an industry that Perk is what comes to mind, <laughs> not necessarily known for sustainability, but in every every step in the uh, the garments journey, um, actually can have um, a, an impact in protecting and serving our environment. So you've got this FIT audience at your at your disposal. You've got change makers who are doing everything that they can to strategize whether it's sourcing, textile production, garment design, manufacturing, doing things more sustainably. But what happens when they pass the baton, so to speak, for garment care um, to you in that product life cycle? And it's really up to the consumer to ensure the longer, better, more sustainable um, care for the garment. And then the second part of that question is using podcasting as an example. How do you effectively step in there and communicate that storytelling? Um, so to your first question, um, what I would say to everyone in the audience, especially those that are up and coming is think about and ask a lot of questions when you're doing your creations or your merchandising about the sourcing of the materials. Um, there's a lot of greenwashing that's gone on in the textile industry regarding um, renewable resources and some of the resources that are used are very renewable. For example, bamboo is a very renewable resource and gets a lot of play. The problem is the process from the, re the bamboo stock to your textiles is a very energy intensive caustic process. Um, so asking certain questions about where you're getting your sourcing, looking at the materials that you want for your designs and where you're going to place them, wool, um, and even cottons now, cottons used to be considered very energy intensive in regards to the use of wa water, but now with a lot of the science that's gone into producing them, um, that footprint has drastically dropped quite a bit. 
but wool in itself is such a wonderful natural renewable resource. Um, and look at those types of materials and fabrics that you start with. How that rolls into us, into the textile realm is very hard for us to measure. One, because our industry, the dry cleaning, the retail dry cleaning industry space is very fragmented. So um, we partnered up and relied on an organization called the Green Business Bureau to help us identify all of the micro things that we do with, or, or even some macro things we do in our plants to help meet our mission for sustainability. So what many may not know that takes place and why it's actually more sustainable for you to use one of our affiliates is, um, and I'll just give you a couple examples. One is uh, the use of technology in the washing and, and chemistry realm are very, very targeted now. We've drastically re reduced our need for hot water, our use for large amounts of water, and also our, our need for large amounts of energy through energy efficient means of just process technology. Like we can have machines now to extract very gentle wool, 100% wool jackets like this down to nearly no moisture in it where we don't need to use heat or energy to dry them anymore. Um, we recycle a lot of our water that we use. And we're also very energy intensive and historically have been in the creation and use of steam and hot water. And in the last 10 years with the advent of some of these process te technologies that allow us to reduce the temperatures and not need very high hot waters or very caustic chemicals like chlorines or high alkalis. We're using oxygen bleaches that are much more natural. We're using, which are peroxides. We're using enzyme technology instead of uh, volatile organic compounds to de degrease now. And these are all much more sustainable and safe for the environment. And that doesn't even get into what we're talking about on the packaging side. Just getting excited over there. <laughs> yeah, and that doesn't even, and you know, that doesn't even get into us removing perk, you know what I mean, what's been around and the technologies that have been developed in using water, what professional wet cleaning, uh, companies like Chrysler Chemical out of Germany that have led the charge in liquefied CO2 cleaning and wet cleaning and silaxane cleanings and technologies. But now they've even taken it further. And now we're re repurposing alcohols from the whiskey industry and created the first USDA bio preferred cleaning solvent called System K4. And it is, it is a secondary byproduct, 100% alcohol that is safe for very, very extremely delicate textiles. And it's a very effective cleaner. And these are used in closed loop systems that do not drain microplastics into the stream. They regenerate and reuse reusable cooling water. So these are things that um, I'll just summarize it with this is I remember when I took the members of the Custom Tailor and Design Association to see a dry cleaners behind the scenes and how seven years later, they still tell me like they had no idea the science that went into this. They had no idea of what was going into this wizardly world of dry cleaning. I usually just drop it off and it comes back. And we're really proud to say that communicating that story is very difficult. And so video and podcasting now allows us, and even through the design work that we do, 3D CAD technology allows us to design facilities and show stakeholders, whether it's the government or the investors, how and in, how energy efficient and how fluid this can be, not just for the uh, the use of consumables, but for the the humans that are there and how we can make them be productive and comfortable and reduce their waste. Uh, and so the podcasting story or the video story allows us to bring that experience as close as we can. And so we coach all of our affiliates because we're proud to say that all of our affiliates have state of the art beautiful, almost Willy Wonka-like factories where you can go and see them. <laughs> you know what I mean? You'd be surprised to see the technology. It's not like your regular washroom um, that goes on in there. Um, the reduction of paper, the reduction of single-use plastic, um, uh, the use of technology in order to for us to be more efficient about all the consumables, both on the energy side when we deliver and pick up with our vans and come back and bring it back to our facilities. Um, we can't tell that story in a text, we have to say it, we have to show you the passion and we have to localize it through um, the videos that say, hey, I know that street or I know that's being done here. Um, and that really resonates a lot with a lot of people. So when you tell the story, um, there is to this day, no better way than video or through a passionate discussion like we are having here in video conferences, um, especially for something as so foreign to most people as dry cleaning. Exactly, and, and and that's the point. The communication aspect of this is is critical to changing hearts and minds. Yep. So, can you 
Can you give us an example of how that message for getting to change somebody's habits rather than just walking down the street or having someone pick it up from their usual uh, from their doorman or the dry cleaners they've been going to for the past 10 years? How do you inspire change and action? Um, can you give an example? Um, well, I can give you an example of how my affiliates have extended their businesses beyond just what you would think in their garments of dry cleaning. So um, in Santa Barbara, California, I have a wonderful affiliate, Ablitz Cleaners, fourth generation family business. Um, has a mission, Sasha Ablett has always had a mission of caring for her people, her community, and her environment. Um, um, when we had our sustainability meeting there, one is we took everyone to see the first salination plant in the United States to understand the broader effect of that. You may not know that soft water is important for our laundry process and soft water allows us to use less consumables and less energy. Um, learning and talking about that story and then how she's reducing her single use plastic turned into her being not just receiving single use plastic for her customers and their poly, but she has opened it up now for the entire community. So it's amazing. I was just in Santa Barbara like a week ago and you see some A-list celebrities walking in, no lie, with big bundles of plastic. And it's not just plastic from the dry cleaners. She takes all your plastic and has a baler and pays the, the, her staff to bail it all up. And then they send it off to be made into Trex decking. So um, that's just one small impact that a small business in my community, in my industry has done. And what it says to everyone is that you can do this. You, if you have a venue, if you have people, it doesn't matter what your business is, think of something creative that shares your values and just act on it. And you'd be surprised how many people really are looking for this type of resource or outlet in your local community. And it's really impactful. Well, that, that's, and let's, Let's talk dollars. What's the uh, estimated lifetime value of a, a dry cleaners like the one in Santa Barbara a customer? And how does that demonstrate an impact for a business as such? Yeah, I mean, we for us in general, we, my clients tend to be on the higher end of the spectrum. So our client lifetime value is we look at it in a 10 year scope. We're looking at anywhere from 15000 to $20,000 of revenue. And that's just the average. Um, and regular dry cleaners are much lower than that. Um, how that impacts on our overall footprint is very, very hard for me to nail down because every area and every locality and every municipality or region of the country is different in regards to how we can source materials. And I think sure. we touched on this on the Rejoice podcast. You know, I, in Northern California and Southern California, my clients are able to have really reduced footprints because they can put solar on their buildings and they can get partnerships to do energy efficiencies where I have affiliates in Florida that are restricted by the utility industry and the actual government that will not allow them to do that. So we rely on our partnerships with the GBB, the Green Business Bureau and our independent certification to allow there to be flexibility within each one of them. But I can tell you through the things I've already de defined to you is like we've made all these, again, micro changes that if I can't put a button on an exact number, I know that over the last 10 to 15 years of us leading on this has been tremendously huge. Um, the easiest place for us to measurement is, is in, in the use of uh, consumable single use poly. We now use machine technology that cuts poly to the right size. We put more garments in it. Um, we were forced to because of the environment that we need to protect things in. Um, we're waiting and we're still waiting for the technology uh, to refine itself so that we can use either corn based, based or other renewable mm -hmm. types of material to make the poly reusable, but it hasn't gotten there yet. And trust me, I listen and I'm on the, the hunt for that at all times. Um, we know through our uh, reduction of, of hazardous waste in our affiliation, we have zero perk users. There is not a single perk user. Um, and all of our affiliates have been the leaders in adopting a lot of these environmentally friendly technologies because we have so much influence in the industry that every new breakthrough they want to test and deploy through us. So that USDA preferred solvent that was deployed 12 of the first machines in the United States went into my affiliation across the United States. And that spurred a, a huge transitional impact. Um, so I can't put a pin on it. 
But I know that if there's anyone that's leading the charge, it's definitely us. And uh, and now you've presented me the challenge to put my team on trying to find a way to measure that. You know what I mean? Because I and think you, it's you important. You know I'm going to come back and ask for the data. So. Yeah, and, and, and it's important. And it's tough because I have affiliates that are um, – carbon counting right and are running carbon neutral mulberries garment care in san francisco and minneapolis st paul is a carbon neutral dry cleaners they do all the things i talked about but they also register and buy their energy that way and they run a ticker and these are and they're all over the place right i'm not we're not franchised we're small independent family mostly multi-generational family businesses that are making immediate impacts and changes locally for their community every day and um and I now will take on the challenge to go and find a way to measure that. So I appreciate yeah. for putting that in for it. Of course. Well, that's what I like to do. I like to challenge all of our stakeholders, partners, service providers, and have these conversations. And that is the inspiration and, and the, the point where we can have these conversations and celebrate at every part of the customer journey and, and share these stories. So I'm going to actually, I'm going to put that in my paperless. I'm going to put that in my paperless notebook right now. <laughs> um, I'm going to pose the same challenge to Tina um, because it's part of the conversation. What is the path to impact? Um, walk us through your journey and, and your storytelling approach because um, Tina gets a tremendous amount of press coverage. So every time she is asked um, to be interviewed, how, do, how does this storytelling for Lolly, um, how do you inspire action and change when you're, when you're Pitching Lolly when you're talking to consumers, talk to me about how communication plays a role. So Lolly is such a personal story for me. Um, I always um, begin with the fact that I'm Cuban and I grew up in Jamaica. And my earliest memories are my mom plucking three leaves from three different trees and crushing them and rubbing them on an insect bite, a bee sting, a sunburn, and literally in 10 seconds, the inflammation and the redness going away and the sting. So I grew up with a, a deep respect for mother nature and um, the power of mother nature and also a love for the ocean. I mean, my childhood was, was there. So I ended up working in the beauty industry and working for all the big companies, which, you know, we don't need to name names, but you know, the big marquee names and um, learn the science of beauty. And I had what happened, what I call is the perfect storm of a crisis of consciousness meets a crisis of health. And I think if I had one of those independently, I may have not had um, the, the courage to pursue my purpose, um, but it was that you know, one, two punch of my health being compromised and then also simultaneously beginning to realize that I had participated in sending into the universe, you know, um, trillions of plastic packaging filled with mostly water and chemicals and synthetics and none of that made any sense. So to answer your question, um, Jennifer, for me, the best communication is connecting back to the story because it's real. There's no greenwashing in that story. It's heartfelt because it is my heart. And as you know, and I'm sure as Chris knows, you know, having your own business is incredibly challenging. And so um, if, if it's not based on true purpose, especially if you're trying to change the planet, um, I don't think you have the power to either stay on your path or convince others to join you. Well, and how do you how do you combat that when we're dealing with um, all of these buzzwords, uh, natural, organic, green, and you are fighting, um, you know, there's a lot of messaging out there and you have the authentic, um, the, um, you want to tell that story, but there's a, you're just dealing with so much. Uh, how do you combat greenwashing? So, um, from my early days in the beauty industry, and I think just a good rule of thumb in business is if you educate the sector, you raise yourself to. So I just try to share information and I don't try to disparage or negative market against, I mean, listen, I think it's fantastic. A lot of good intentions out there. I just want to say whether in 
fashion, in dry cleaning, I'm learning so much, or in <laughs> beauty, um, you know, not everyone is trying to dupe the consumer and get away by taking shortcuts. They are just very naive and they believe what their vendors, uh, Karen, I, you know, I love what you, I think you said about, you know, no, Chris, you said about really asking questions about the sourcing, like bamboo fabric sounds fantastic, but if it's sourced, you know, in a bad way, it's not good. I, I talk about that kind of learning all the time, like, People tend to want the information presented very easily to them and they tend to take it on surface value and um, you really have to dig in. So my attitude is I raise the industry. I educate, I give information without really talking about lolly necessarily, but just trying what does biodegradable mean versus compostable Are bioplastics a good thing. And, you know, by doing that, you engage people in the the conversation and you empower them and okay, i think that that's a very important piece because we're yeah. all learning especially in sustainability we're all learning in this journey for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction you know the law of physics and karen i just saw a big smile and um <laughs> and you know with these new technologies you think you're doing well but then you find out that you know, and I talk about this all the time because we use glass packaging and um, we've been challenged. Why don't we use aluminum? And I've said, because guess what? It's really hard to find recycled aluminum in the beauty industry. There's virgin aluminum, but virgin aluminum, when you mine it, causes more of a negative impact than glass. So we're, you know, it's just. There's so much to learn and so much knowledge to share. And I think that having a forum and whether you're using social media, TikTok, I'm trying to get on TikTok right now and <laughs> use that or Instagram or podcasts. I love podcasts. I love panels, but wherever you can share and you can teach and, um, and you can, you know, you know, collaborate. Like I, all of a sudden, Chris, I was like, wow, I need to connect to you because there could be some learnings that we could use, you know? Well, that's, and my next question was going to be, do you have an example that you can share with everyone of when you were using one of these communication vehicles, whether it was podcasting or, or um, I know you're new to TikTok, where you were able to kind of change a habit or educate a consumer and you got feedback from them and you were able to um, kind of win them over or inspire them. Um, do you have any good examples to share with everyone? So I think that um, some of the most impactful um, things that we talk about is the fact that most of the beauty products you're buying are 80 to 95% water. I mean, think about that. You buy 15 products across your personal care regimen, whether it's your shampoo and conditioner, your body lotion or gel, um, your body cream, your face cream, your cleanser, your cleanser for your, I mean, think about it. And those vary in size from like eight ounce to 16 ounce. 95% of that is water. So you're buying water in plastic, whether it's a tube or, uh, you know, a pump or, you know, shaker bottle, it doesn't matter. And um, when you think you're buying water to then step in the shower or turn on the faucet in your sink to add more water, right? And most people, when they do that, and Jennifer and I were laughing about this the other day, leave the faucet on, like, right? So you're washing your teeth and you're talking to someone on their phone and your water is going, or you get in the shower and you're washing your hair and you leave the shower going while, you know. Um, so, you know, just talking about that and educating consumers about that, it's such an aha moment. Whether they're going to make a switch to zero waste, water-free, be um, waterless beauty, or not, it's like, oh my God, like I need to start buying powdered cleanser for my detergent. I need to, they, like, there's just an aha moment. Like, and, and then also to have them like really think about walking down the, you know, the, the, what do you call it? The aisles of like Walmart or Target. And it's just rows and rows of water, whether you're in the home cleaning section 
or the personal care section, right? Water and plastic and chemicals. And by the way, the chemicals are all from the oil industry, petrochemicals. Yeah. So that's another thing, you know, another aha moment and where um, customers just like get horrified is when I talk about what do you think Aquaphor or Vaseline is? And that's the number one thing that your dermatologist or plastic surgeon tell you to use when you have a scar or after surgery, you know, on, on the incision, once it starts to heal, Aquaphor Vaseline, it is a direct derivative of crude oil. It's petrol, petrolatum. Does well, that make any sense? I, I can totally relate to um, what Tina's saying there too, because it's the same in the commercial laundry and home laundry thing. Most of your home laundry detergent is water. Um, and in our space, we buy concentrate. We buy concentrated non-water derivative product because it's just more efficient and it's more effective and it's just smart. And, and at the end of the day, this was brought to me by Dr. Zyder, who has been on the forefront of all of our cleaning technologies in Germany, Dr. Manfred Zyder. He said, uh, we had a panel maybe 10 years ago, and he said this very clearly, being sustainable is just great business sense. It's mm -hmm. just, it will have great profound impact on your bottom line. It does not make any sense not to do it. And it's, it's true. And this is a prime example of it. Why am I buying water to put in water? Right. Exactly. Oh, and so I'm so happy that we were able to make that connection between the two of you today. Um, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> moving on and Chris, I'm going to, um, quote you again, you said to me in our last podcast interview, we speak the same language in different voices in a different format. Can you expand on that concept a little bit and how any live format can be a vehicle to spread a message for change? Well, I think this just panel and what this exchange we just had says it all, right? Is um, Tina's coming from the, the personal care space. I'm coming from the textile care space. Um, we're telling you the same exact story. We're telling you the exact, exact principles and, and we're sharing the similar values. It's just in a different aspect of your life. And sometimes it just needs a different voice or come at you from a different angle. Or as you can see, going back to what Karen was talking about, the small changes that we can make, these are all things that we do every single day, whether it's brushing our teeth, putting on makeup, doing our laundry. If we just thought a little bit more about them, we can make profound change. So um, that would be what I mean in regards to the different voice. Um, and I think that there's so many things like where I think big brands get uh, kind of capitalized on what their mission is and tell you what it is. And a lot of times the smaller, more impactful local or regional um, products or niche products like I have and like what uh, service and like what Tina sell we get washed out and sometimes it's hard for us to get through that. Um, and we're really, and I'm not taking away from what other big global conglomerates are trying to do in their green things because they have big impact also, but it's not one or the other. It's all of us together trying to make these changes. And I work in different spectrums of the fashion industry. Um, I'm not gonna say something bad about uh, some of the brands, but I do know that the circular fashion movement now that is going on right now has been long in coming. And it's been amazing to see some of the most elite couture brands finally embrace it. Um, and I mean, I think back to when Chanel um, uh, several years back went into talking about how they're gonna limit and be smarter using technology about placing their products because they were destroying so many garments at the end of the year. And where does all that wonderful fabric and embellishment material go? It goes into landfill and why? Um, Births fast fashion right now and really going back to the question of asking where your trend based instagram i need to look like this off the runway show fast fashions come from if you start looking at the care label and i strongly suggest all of you learn about care labels and read about 100 percent rayon and learn about acetates and learn about some of these very very caustic processed fibers that are out there um they live in landfills forever um where yes, i have um, and, and also they don't no i have lots of textile amas coming up on our our podcast so yeah it's really it's exciting and it, it's fun to share this information too because it's not necessarily something that you think about as a consumer when you're 
looking at it on the rack or you're online and you're purchasing it. It's not something you make the time to dig in and research. And yet consumers are shopping their values, they're voting their values, and they want to know more. So part, part of the rejoice process is to put that information at people's fingertips. And we're starting out by having these conversations and building this community. So I'm so glad to see people are actually caring and they want the information now. So, um, okay, so moving on, Tina, tell me, because you are interviewed so frequently, and I know you oftentimes have like live uh, media opportunities. Tell us something fun. Tell us like, I. One of your strengths is being able to articulate your storytelling, communicate this message, whether it's um, a product attribute or it's being able to share your story. But tell us something crazy. What's the weirdest, so, like um, unscripted, funniest yeah, the, media experience? I don't know if I would say it was funny, but one of my, um, I guess, most difficult or you know, sort of, I had a deer in headlights moment because it had never happened to me as I was being, I was pitching actually, it was um, for a podcast called The Pitch on Gimlet Media, sort of like a shark tank, but a podcast. And um, I was out in, it was out in um, near Stanford University and it was in the room and you have, they bring in like four VCs and it's taped, you know, live basically. And um, you had to get up and pitch and you had five minutes and I had brought some product with me. And one of our um, best sellers, I don't have it here with me, but um, is an upcycled beauty oil from a very rare plum. And it's an incredible product, but it has a very distinctive smell because we use food grade ingredients. We don't put like chemical fragrances. So it smells like the combination of like marzipan and, um, but a little bit like it fruity at the same time. Some people, it reminds them of like an antibiotic they had as a child if they grew up in Europe because they used to use this like marzipan -y, anyway, cherry kind of scent. Um, so I saw the four judges walk in and they sat down and one of them was a tech you didn't know who they were going to be before they came in the room. You weren't allowed to know. And one of them was a tech VC and, you know, he slouched in his chair and you could tell immediately from his body language that he had zero desire to listen to this pitch. Beauty wasn't his thing. He didn't know the category. He didn't care. And um, so I start, I start my pitch and he stops me and he says, can you show me the product? And usually I'm very careful about like when, you know, like controlling the experience with the product, but I was sort of stressed. I handed the product over and um, he immediately opens it and he pours a ton on his hand because he doesn't know how to use a beauty oil, right? And he smells it and he goes, oh, this smells horrible. <laughs> and I was like, and of course, then the three other judges start like, wait, let me smell. Oh, I don't know. This this is on the podcast. Like, <laughs> all on a podcast. And oh. they start like debating whether it, ha it smells bad or not. And I just saw the entire situation running away from me. <laughs> and it, um, it was such an interesting moment because you can't tell someone that they're wrong, right? You can't say, you know, you, no, it doesn't smell bad. Like some people react to certain scents, but it was just like, how do you wheel back? So I guess that the, the storyline here is when, whatever your business is, whatever you're um, trying to pitch, whether it's, you know, in school um, to get a grade or it's to raise money for a startup or it's to get a business on your platform or whatever it is, um, you have to really, when those moments when people react negatively, you have to really think about how you nuance that because you, you, you can't say no, right? So what I ended up doing is I, I paused and I said, let's talk about the scent. What you don't like in that scent is actually what makes this product so powerful because it's 100% concentrated upcycled food grade ingredients. And then all of a sudden, like, they all stopped, it shut them up, and then they allowed me to keep going. <laughs> so um, it was it was a scary moment, but but it was a good learning. 
Well, and that's, it's one of those things that keeps you on your toes. And when we're talking about communication and inspiring people to change, you know, and I started off this panel talking about feelings and those are personal and facts, which are, you know, what we're contending with here, sustainability and climate change and all of this data. And as, as Karen and I were talking about the science behind all of this, we are up against uh, global warming and a, a changing planet. So we're, we're trying to move things in the right direction. We're trying to sway people to change their habits. And one of the things that I, I do ask people in the podcast interviews are, tell me something personal that um, you can use to sway people and inspire people to create change. So when I've interviewed you both, I've asked you to kind of step outside of your business silo and share a personal story. Give me an inside look at how you either shop or live sustainably. And that, that personal side of the conversation has been um, really interesting to me. There's been a, a common thread and it's like a peek inside your, your personal life, whether it's um, the type of coffee you drink and where it's been sourced. I, I swear I know every single founder's um, type of coffee that they like to drink now. Uh, or it's more like a, um, without fail, like a, a personal tip. Um, Tina, I know all about your, your composting in Carl Schurz Park and the Upper East Side because it's so near and dear to your, you and your mom. Um, Chris, you have been so passionate about uh, local politics and how you exact change on the local level because that's where you can really see climate change um, policy make an actual difference. So my question for you both, um, can you, Share an example of where you can see an effective path to impact um, to environmental change, maybe something at the local level in your respective business industries. Uh, I'll jump in. Um, uh, this is this is a recent thing, and I can't actually name the name yet, but um, I'm, I'm launching a new product and um, the product is a cleanser and it's a vitamin C cleanser and um, I wanted to use orange um, peel powder in it. And um, just by chance, um, I happened to ask someone in my network about a very rare orange that only comes out several months a year. And they happened to know the founder, they're out in California and had a very um, casual conversation. It turned out they were beginning to think what to do with their misfits. And so we started having a conversation and the net net is for the first time ever, they're going to start upcycling their misfit peels and we're going to incorporate that into our cleanser. And so we're gonna do a collaboration and launch this product with their name and it's a very well-known orange name. So um, it's a really fun thing and it's, it's literally helping them change their business model because they've been thinking about it for so long, but they didn't know like, okay, we create these byproducts, oil or powder, what do we do with it? So um, it's a really, and it all happened literally in a few weeks. Chris, do you have a, a local example? Um, well, for me, um, I live, I live in Anchorage, Alaska now, so a lot of the things that we talk about in climate um, affect me locally. Um, on, on the positive tip, I would say more that it has affected me more in local governments around the lower 48 because of project work that I've done. And I think people need to be aware of is um, with COVID, there's been a lot of com uh, uh, c consolidation taking place and a lot of funding has been put into place for us to build new facilities, new buildings, new technology and process facilities and plants. Um, and what we have come to find out, and I touched on this earlier, is how in some regions of the United States, and many people may not know this, that your local government is a very much a proponent and your partner in trying to initiate some of these programs and lead standards, whether it's solar and all that. But it's been extremely frustrating when we're sitting with large amounts of capital, some of it very much funded through the federal government in recent COVID relief bills, but now even moving forward in these potential infrastructure bills to put in energy saving uh, initiatives or um, processing technologies and these local governments now 
are restricting us from doing that, whether they haven't um, educated themselves to do that, whether there's some political will against it, um, whether there's just an old boys club. And unfortunately, one of them is regionally in, the, in upper Westchester County right now in New York. You know, it's a, a, a difficulty decision dealing with um, 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 in Scarsdale, working on a building that has historical value, but we want to upcycle a lot of things that are in it, but also we want to add new technologies to it. And they're not going to allow, whether through restrictions or funding or local um, um, historical uh, boards saying, no, we don't want that. And so I think that a lot of people need to start to realize that if you get involved in your local politics and really start listening what's going on, I think there might be a disconnect between a lot of the community values and where you want to see it to go and what your representatives are allowing to take place. And whether there's nepotism, favoritism, or just straight up old school politics involved, um, your voice has the greatest impact right now there. And um, and that's become extremely frustrating for us. Um, I don't even want to talk about Alaska politics because it's a whole other thing, when, especially when you're in an energy sector state. And um, and we're going through some turmoil today. Our, our municipal elections were yesterday, so um, that we'll we'll park that conversation for another day. Um, but yeah, I would say if for anyone that's listening, wherever you live, you should just get involved. You'd be surprised. Get into community council, find out what they're doing. There is millions and millions of dollars being showered down on your local communities right now with the intent of being done and put in put forward for climate change initiatives. But a lot of these are putting in general funds and a lot of them are gonna sit there and not be uh, spent where they're intended. So your voice will help direct that money. All right, and I'm gonna pop in here with that moment. Uh, Chris, that seems like such a perfect segue for me to remind our audience members, if they do have questions for Tina and Chris or Jennifer, to pop those into the chat, if you are looking for the chat function in WebEx, click the um, three dots by more options if you don't see it already on your screen um, or a little bit further in some people's views, it'll be over to the far right hand side. So pop those into the chat and I will feed those to our panelists. Um, and while I have the mic in this second, then I'm gonna give it back to Jennifer who I'm sure has a few more things to say. Okay, Tina and Chris, as a chemist, I sat here and thought of like eight new courses we could write collaboratively <laughs> and focus on utilizing practice in these spaces um, as teaching tools and as components within the lesson. Chris, I started with you and all I could see was an entire chemistry course related to cleaning methods and green cleaning, yeah. um, in, including that. And in Tina, I saw so much about extractions and look the look and work we could do in the space of toxicology and understanding um toxicology both from botanicals and natural products and also from synthetics and the differences um beyond that so i think this was so rich jennifer last bits before i take a few of the questions from the audience because we're running out of time here on wednesday evening <laughs> Oh, no, I was just, I was going to wrap up by, by talking about the fact that, like, these are two people who really are committed to spreading the message for change. And if I wanted to allow them to have this, this particular panel as the vehicle for um, their hope for a positive planet, positive experience. So if they have any closing remarks, because we'll have plenty of future podcast opportunities. To, uh, I mean, this inspired so many other topics. I'm, I'm happy to welcome them back on the, our Rejoice podcast. <laughs> sure, Tina, please go first. Yeah, um, thank you for that, Jennifer and Karen. Absolutely, I'd love to participate. Like, however, we we could, you know, stir up some magic in the science lab together. Um, but um, what I would say is, um, if you have a dream, if you want to make a change don't worry about not having all the answers when you begin. Um, you know, I have a friend who recently passed and he used to say to me, if you wanna catch a bus, miss a bus, because at least you're st standing at the bus station. And you can't make any change if you do nothing. So just start and you learn and you grow. Like I never knew that 
I would end up having growing mushrooms for our packaging and then wrapping it in upcycled hemp when I began. Like that just wasn't in my mind, but I knew I wanted to clean up the dirty business of beauty. And, you know, it's been three or four years and through that process, I learned different things along the way and it's now gotten us here. So just put one foot in front of another and start the process. Yeah, I would say that I, I'm definitely hopeful for the future um, from my experience, um, whether it's been participating in classes at FIT with a uh, previous um, with Sal and his crew or being out in the field with the young people that I see coming in. Uh, I think that um, the empathy and the, and the consciousness, the conscientiousness that I see of the next generation about people and relating to people and caring for people is something that I hope you do not lose. It's very easy to be cynical in this world and get downgraded or, or beat up for your values, but stick to them and, you know, set goals and just know that your success and how you define success is yours and yours alone. It's not defined by anyone else. So just find your goal and go after it. And I think that if you ask some really important, tough questions of yourself and the people around you regarding your values and make sure you stay on your value path, you will be successful. All right, thank you. Now we do just have one question from the audience and it really gets at the spirit, I think of economics in this space and the reality that especially, you know, kind of in today's market and historically speaking, that products made from petrochemicals have been much more financially accessible, especially for people who are living pay, pay, paycheck to paycheck. How do you think we start to address that reality in today's market towards the kinds of change that you both are speaking to in this space? I'll jump in first. Um, it's such a great question. And as a young, small startup, um, I, I grapple with this because I see, and I come across a lot of opportunities where, um, I find maybe really interesting biotech companies that are working on fermentation as answers to some of the petrochemicals um, in the beauty industry. But I don't have the buying power to help them necessarily commercialize. If I go to them and I say, I'll be your case study, like let's get this out there, let's learn from launching in Lolly. When they look at my numbers, they're like, oh, is that worth our time? You know. And what's fascinating is I have some multinational investors, you know, um, that came into Lolly early on and they're, you know, through their venture funds and stuff. And there've been times where I've gone to them and said, I have this opportunity. If we came in together and we use Lolly as the pilot, but with the idea that we could then, you know, go up the flagpole to the big ship, you know, then we could really reduce the cost and make this happen economically and make a real change. And they're not interested, you know, it's like they want to wait. So I, I think my answer is how do we create coalitions and collaborations instead of competing against each other? How do we come together so we can make these technologies, whether they're ingredient technologies or packaging, packaging technologies affordable to the indie brands or the smaller companies that have the vision but don't have the pocketbook yeah i mean i i could challenge that question from my industry's perspective and um we were on a glide trajectory to start to reduce our consumption and use of petrochemicals or products from petrochemicals um for many reasons um, but COVID was the mass instigator, right? The, 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 the event that really forced us. Um, and what it was is supply chain issues, right? So when we started having supply chain issues, all of a sudden now we could not get hangers from uh, places. We could not get plastic from places. So now it forced us to change our business models. Some of us were leading already in it and it just accelerated where we were going. But for many in our industry, um, we had to move into the recycle mode, right? And we realized that not only wasn't it we could do it and it wasn't as drastic as we thought, but it also became great economic sense. And it's allowed us as small independent businesses 
to a certain degree, hold our pricing in check with this, with the inflation, the transitory inflation that we're seeing. Um, and so you can imagine for a lot of people in our industry, our industry took an 80% loss in business uh, uh, the first month of COVID. And so that, that disruption creates a lot of challenges and forces a lot of change. And then that turns into consumer behaviors, right? And so I think that um, a lot of it is painted by the petrochemical and the hydrocarbon industries to be like, you can't do this. And they're able to manipulate markets in a certain degree. And it goes to what uh, Tina's saying is that, you know, they force smaller innovators out. But I think at the end of the day, it always happens at the counter, right? Or on the phone call or in your app. When you make that transaction, you have the power to make the decision to do or spend with someone who's making that change. And um, it's going to take more than just innovators like us to do that. It's going to take everyone that's listening and everyone who buys any type of consumable product to make the change. And it's a shift. It is a shift. I think you're both so correct. We have one more note in the chat, which is really, I think, actually the perfect thing for me to utilize as kind of a summary point to close us out today, which is much of what you're talking about really also requires open source and true transparency um, within the supply chain for us to make this. I think um, that was a really great kind of point to note um, as to how you're doing this, because much of this has been discussed today throughout this. I, we spent time this morning talking about it with the window of textile opportunity group in that panel as well. We actually said the exact same thing that open source and transparency within the supply chain and collaboration at all levels is really helpful to making real change in this space. Um, I can't tell you what a pleasure it has been to talk about and think about how we are communicating about the pillars of sustainability here with you today. Jennifer, it's so inspiring to see an alumni from FIT really working to do this and speaking to this and spreading this message. But even without your FIT connection, your work in communication around sustainability is really providing a vehicle for people like Chris and Tina to share their stories, talk about their brands. Um, I hope that so many people are listening and thinking about how they can be part of these shifts and part of the pathways forward where we are changing the amount of impact we have. It has been my great pleasure to sit with all of you today. I couldn't be happier. I encourage you as we wrap this to hear from FIT Sustainability Ambassador Amber Valletta, who is closing out our conference this year. This is the 16th Annual Sustainable Business and Design Conference. And without any more further ado, I hope that everybody will be back here for our 17th Annual Conference, because I know that so many of the points we talked about today, all of these intersections, that we should be able to come back next year and talk about all the progress that we're making in this space. So again, Jennifer, Tina, Chris, such a pleasure. And I hope that we can find future ways to collaborate to our audience. Thanks so much for hanging with us a little bit long on Wednesday evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Thank you.